All right, hello class. Uh, today's first video lesson will be on 4.3, solving polynomial inequalities. Uh, keep in mind uh, that solving an inequality, okay, uh, remember that means it has to have uh, the greater than, uh, less than, greater than or equal to, or less than or equal to symbol. Uh, today's is going to be a little more complicated than where we left off, which was at solving linear inequalities. Um, that one was easier because it not only just because it had degree one, but also because with linear inequalities, all you have to do is isolate x on one side of the inequality symbol. Uh, unfortunately, that is no longer the case for when we deal with polynomial inequalities. Um, so these are typically um, when I say polynomial, it does include linear. However, in these cases today, polynomial inequalities will be of degree two or higher. Okay, so if you see linear, you can solve it the way we did in 4.2. Um, if you see degree two or higher, you're gonna have to use some methods that we go over today. All right, so let's kind of start off here with this question. It says, determine where the function f of x is greater than zero. So this is on this function here, this blue graph, okay? That is basically me asking, where is the graph above the x-axis, okay, in terms of its y values? So where is the, um, the graph above the x-axis? So as you can see, I've already shaded it in there. It's above the x-axis in this little interval here. Okay, so from that zero to this zero, and then everything after that zero as well, because it stays above the x-axis afterwards. So how do we write that? We would say the solution to this inequality, okay, so the solution to this inequality is x is an element of and then we say between negative two and two, so from this zero to this zero, it's above the x-axis, okay? And then in union with, and then we say two to infinity, so everything greater than two, okay? Notice that we use circle brackets, and that's because we just asked for when the function is above, okay? So it just says greater than up here. If it said greater than or equal to, that'd be a different story. So right now it's just the blue area. However, if I did say, if I change this symbol to greater than or equal to, so if I said, when is the graph greater than or equal to zero, then we would be able to include the zeros in our solution, okay? Because now it's including it here. So if it's equal to zero, that means we can include the x-intercepts. So in that case, it would be everything from here, this is where the function is zero, it would be everything from here forward. So instead of chopping it up into pieces, we can actually just say x is an element of square bracket, because we can include this zero, so negative two to infinity. Okay. So that's how the question will change if you have a greater than or a greater than or equal to. Okay, let's try another question here. So we've got two functions. We got we have f of x here, which is our polynomial function, um, and it looks like it could be of degree three. Um, and we've got our g of x, which is a line. So it's asking us when is f of x, okay, greater than g of x. So when is the f of x graph lying above? the g of x graph. So when does it have larger y values? So that would be in this case right here. Okay, so from here to here, f of x is above g of x. So we would describe that as between, and then remember you look at the x values. So that would be between negative five is where they first intersect and then they stop intersecting at negative one. So from negative five to negative one is gonna be one interval. 
And then the other interval is going to be, so again, I'm looking to see when f of x is greater than g, and that would be all over here. So that would be all x values greater than 1. Okay, so we would write this solution as... Um, if we use in set notation, we could say um, x is between negative 5 and negative 1, or x is greater than 1, or we can write an interval notation, which is x is an element of, and then uh, circle bracket negative 5 to negative 1, close circle bracket, and union with 1 to infinity. Okay, so that is represented there. Okay, now we want to determine when f of x is less than or equal to g of x. Okay, so when f of x is less than or equal to g of x. So that should be every other interval that exists. So we can see this f of x graph is less than or equal to g of x in this interval, in this interval, and after that uh, there are no more. So we have to identify these in red. Okay. So that would be everything less than negative 5, right? So everything this way forward. And then everything between negative 1 and 1, right? Remember, our answer is always in terms of x values. So if we write that in interval notation, we can say x is the element of negative infinity to negative 5, and notice we can use a square bracket, and that's because we had the equal to symbol here, okay. in union with um, negative 1 to 1, both with square brackets, again, because it's allowed to be equal to one another at that point. Okay, so please make sure you are noticing the symbols here and how that makes a difference. Okay, so uh, we're going to go over, first of all, how to solve a polynomial inequality graphically and then algebraically, okay? So for solving it graphically, that would look something like this. So you have um, some function on one side and then the inequality symbol and then another function on the other. So we're going to leave it as is in these cases. So your first step is you're going to graph each side of the inequality as a separate function on the same grid. So you're going to take p of x, you're going to draw it, you're going to take g of x, and you're going to draw it. Okay, so let's kind of start with that. We'll go over these steps as we try this example here. We're going to solve the inequality 2x minus 5. So when is this linear function less than or equal to this quadratic, x squared minus 5? Okay, and we're going to do this without rearranging. So let's graph uh, the left side and the right side. Okay. So let's start graphing f of x equals 2x minus 1. So we can graph that using our slope and y-intercept. Okay, so y-intercept of negative 5, slope of 2 over 1. So go ahead and draw that. We are going to draw the quadratic function, x squared minus 5. Uh, you can do this um, in a few ways, but hopefully you're recognizing that this is a parent function that has been transformed with a c value of negative 5. So if you want, you can just use your mapping notation to graph this. So I know my x's aren't being affected and all my y values are being subtracted by 5. Okay, and that is because here c equals negative 5. Okay, so just using your mapping statement. That will produce uh, the new coordinates for our quadratic. Okay? Or you can just realize that you're going to take the original parent function, move everything five units down. So once we do that, we're going to graph both those on the same graph over here. So you should get this line and then this parabola. And when you do something graphically, uh, when I have you do questions like this, uh, the two graphs will always intersect at a clear point, okay. or, or two clear points as well. So it won't be a hard decimal answer for you to see. Okay, so our next step, as we come back up here, is step two, points of intersection of the functions. 
So that's what you want to find first. So find those two points, or it may be one point. Um, so, and I can locate those here. So I can notice that they intersect with one another at this point here and this point here. So at zero, negative five, and at two and negative one. Those are our two points of intersection. So again, all we really care about here is the X coordinates where they intersect. Because when we give our solution, our solution is always in terms of X values. So I want to know what happens before 0, what happens between 0 and 2, and then what happens after 2. So now we're going to look and not notice when I read it left to right, it says, when is the linear function less than or equal to the quadratic? Less than or equal to, so that means below or equal to. So as you can see, I've highlighted here the areas where the line is less than, okay, meaning has lower y values than the quadratic. Okay, so that's at this section here and this section here. The only time the line is above the quadratic is here. You can see it has larger y values. So that means I have to identify these sections. So that's from the point of intersection all the way to the left here, that first point of intersection. And then it's from this other point of intersection going all the way to the right. So I have to represent these two pieces as the solution to this inequality. So that means we are going to say the solution is, um, and again, you can do interval or set notation. So x is an element of negative infinity to 0 um, square bracket because we have the equal to symbol here. So it can include the points of intersection in union with square bracket 2 to infinity. Okay? Or you can write it like this in our set notation. Okay? Unless I specify the notation, you can use either one, whatever you're comfortable with. But that is how we use um, uh, graphical uh, models in order to solve inequalities like this. Okay, let's move to the next page. All right, how do we solve a polynomial inequality uh, algebraically? Okay, so the key thing here is how do we do this without graphing? Okay, so what we have to do first is move all terms to one side of the inequality so that one side is equal to zero. Okay, so that means those are two things that we have to do. So if we notice here in this example, uh, it says solve this inequality. What's really nice for us here is that all the terms are already on one side of the inequality and one side is equal to zero. So that's good. Step two, factor the polynomial and find the zeros. All right, so again, this example is good for us because I can see that there are one, two, three, four factors. So it's already put in factored form. So our next step is to do one of two things. Okay. We can either use an interval chart to determine the intervals where the polynomial is positive or negative. In this case here, because we have the polynomial on the left side and it's less than zero, that means I want to know when the function is negative because that would be less than zero. Or we're going to do um, something where we graph the new function we have and see where it lies above or below the x-axis, depending on what's being asked of us. So let's start with method number one, which is our interval chart. Okay, so this would be solving it algebraically. Okay. So once you have it in your factored form, you can easily see your zeros. Okay, so in this case, our zeros are 2, 4, and negative 3. These are very important, so I want you to come follow this arrow here. And I want you to think of your number line. If you were to write those out on a number line, negative 3 would come first, then 2, and then 4. So how many intervals did that create on the number line? So how many sections did that create? So if you have three zeros, that means when you chop up the number line, it creates 1, 2, 3, 4 sections that we have to cover. Those are going to be the intervals that you put at the top 
columns of your interval chart. So our first interval are all x values less than negative 3, then all the numbers between negative 3 and 2, so that's going to be here, all the x values between 2 and 4, and all the x values greater than 4. I also want you to leave a row here, so you're always going to have to draw these out. You're going to leave a row for the test point. You can do this if you'd like to. If you don't want to after that, you don't need to. Uh, the test point just refers to a number that falls within that interval that you created. Okay, so for example here, a test point that's less than negative 3 is negative 4. A number that's between negative 3 and 2 is 0. So you're always just putting that in just as your reference point. Uh, as the row headers over here, you're going to put every single factor okay, of the equation that you had when you isolated it and factored it over here. So that means my, I'm putting my first factor of negative 2, x minus 2, x minus 4, x plus 3. Then you're going to do a line because we're going to sum that or we're going to multiply all those together. And then your bottom line should be the total f of x. So the value of the entire function. All right, so let's start going through each interval. So when x is less than negative 3, our test point's negative 4. Notice that our first factor, negative 2, does not have a variable. So that means I can't sub negative 4 into anything. So if it's negative 2, then I know negative 2 is always going to be negative. So I put a negative symbol there. Negative 4, I'm going to sub in for x into this factor. So that would be negative 4 minus 2. That would give us negative 6. That would give us a negative. We're going to put that here. Negative 4 minus 4. That would give us negative 8. Another negative. So all you care about here are the signs of the result. Negative 4 plus 3 would give us negative 1. So that would result in a negative. So notice here, okay, all of these factors in the equation are being multiplied in this expression here. So that means I need to use my um, knowledge of positives and negatives and multiplying. So I know two negatives multiplied would create a positive. I know these two negatives multiplied would create a positive. When you multiply everything together, that means you're doing a positive times a positive which means you are ending up with a positive answer. So if you want to show this little side work, um, go ahead, you can. Um, eventually, a lot of students are able to just do this in their head, and they don't need to show that side work. Okay. Let's move on to the next interval. Our test point is 0. When I sub 0 into negative 2, I can't sub it in because there's no variable. Negative 2 is just negative. When I sub 0 into x minus 2, I get a negative. 0 minus 4, a negative. 0 plus 3, I get a positive. So notice here, two negatives multiplied by each other produces a positive. A negative and a positive multiplied by each other gives a negative. And then obviously when you multiply them all together, that would be a positive times a negative, which gives you a negative. Notice that I highlighted this interval because this is one of my desired answers. When you look up at the polynomial here, I wanted to know when f of x was less than 0. So that means I'm looking for negative results, and this is one interval that will answer that. All right, let's keep going. And I know this seems like a lot of work at first, but you're going to get very used to it and be able to get through these interval charts quickly. So now we're subbing in 3. Well, we know negative 2 has no variable, so that's just negative. Uh, 3 minus 2, positive. 3 minus 4, negative. 3 plus 3, positive. So these two will create a negative when multiplied. These two will create a negative when mul multiplied. So a negative times a negative will produce a positive. All right, our last one, x greater than 4, our test point is 5. We know negative 2 is always going to be negative. 
5 minus 2, positive. 5 minus 4, positive. 5 plus 3, positive. These two multiplied will create a negative. These two multiplied will create a positive. A positive times a negative is a negative result. Again, I highlight, you don't have to, but I always highlight the sections that um, I'm looking for. So I just found out without graphing the two intervals that solve this inequality. So I found out when f of x was less than zero. So that means our solution is x is an element of negative three to two in union with four to infinity. Okay, so you can write it in this notation in the interval chart, or um, you can write it um, like this with our brackets. Okay, and that would be a complete answer. So at the end, you have to state this therefore statement. Notice that I did not use square brackets, and that's because the inequality symbol did not have an equal to sign. Okay, another way of solving this, so if I asked you to solve this inequality graphically, okay, so two ways. If I had you to do this graphically, there's a lot of similar steps. So notice you still have to move all terms to one side, one side still has to be factored, and that's because we cannot sketch a graph of this function without seeing the zeros. So how would we do this? This is a good refresher of past units. We would start by graphing um, by using our key features. So that would be our end behaviors. So I would notice from this here, so from f of x, okay, so notice I'm referring to f of x. Okay, so once it's been brought over and factored, Okay, so a leading coefficient is negative. We have an odd degree of three. So that means uh, we know that it's as X approaches negative infinity, Y approaches infinity. And as X approaches infinity, Y approaches negative infinity. Uh, we're gonna analyze our zeros in orders. So we know zeros of two, four, and negative three. They all have an order of one. Therefore, they all cross the X axis in a linear fashion. So then we're going to sketch our graph. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect here. It's just a rough sketch. When you're solving polynomial inequalities, all you care about is the zeros and the orders, and then the rest you can solve by visually looking at it. So remember, we want to find when f of x is below the x-axis. So notice I've highlighted in purple where the function is underneath the x-axis. So that's a quick way of finding this solution, and you should get the same solution that you got algebraically. So sometimes I will tell you to do one or the other. Sometimes I will leave it open, and you guys get to choose what method you want. Um, if you choose algebraic, you have to do every step I've shown here on the left, and if you choose to do graphically, uh, then you have to show every single step that I've shown here on the right. Okay? All right, so if I gave an example like this, so solve this inequality, so we've got, looks like one function on this side greater than or equal to another function here, a linear function on the right. You have two options for solving this that we have gone over so far. One, we can leave the inequality as is, graph both sides, find their point of intersection, and then examine. So this would be very similar to what we did on the previous page. Okay. Like I said, sometimes that's tricky because they don't have clear point of intersections that we can find by hand. So the qu quick and easy way to move on would be to modify the inequality by bringing all terms to one side and setting the other side equal to zero. Okay, so very similar to kind of the steps uh, that we will do here. So let's practice doing that. Okay. So let's take our inequality and let's bring everything to one side. Uh, notice here, so let me highlight what we're working with here. So this is the inequality we're working with. Um, it does not matter what side you bring all the terms to. So you can bring the, these two terms over here, you can bring all these guys over there. It doesn't matter, you will get the same answer regardless. Okay, so I've decided to bring these two terms over. 
and set this side equal to zero. So notice I brought it over, so now it becomes minus 16x um, plus 8 greater than or equal to zero. All right, our next step, once you uh, collect like terms, so when we collect like terms here, we're going to get x cubed plus 5x squared minus 14x greater than or equal to zero. So remember, we can't draw a sketch of this function without finding the zeros, and we can't find the zeros without factoring. So I take out a GCF of x, and then I'm left with x squared plus 5x minus 14. So I know that this is a simple trinomial. So I look for two numbers that multiply to negative 14 and add to 5, and those are 7 and negative 2. So I am happy now because I have um, my function f of x. I'm going to refer to that as f of x, all in nice factored form, okay, with one side equal to 0. All right, so now I can identify my zeros. Okay, so 0 at 0, negative 7, and 2. All right, I have, um, they all have an order of 1. Therefore, they all have a linear shape at the x-axis. We continue up here. Um, our end behaviors. Uh, the leading coefficient is positive. The degree three, is, sorry, the degree is three, therefore odd. So we know that as x approaches negative infinity, y approaches negative infinity, and then as x approaches infinity, so does y. So let's sketch that graph. And it should look something like this. Now notice, remember what you're trying to answer. Okay, A lot of students will just stop right here because they're used to just that being the point from other units. You are trying to answer when is this graph, so when is f of x greater than or equal to zero? So that means when is it above the x-axis, right? Greater than zero is positive numbers. So that means uh, between this 0 and this 0, so negative 7 and 0, and then everything greater than 2. So I've highlighted the areas of the graph that satisfy this. Now notice that our inequality has the equal to symbol, so that means it can include the zeros. So if you're doing interval notation, you can put the square brackets at negative 7, 0, and 2 if you ever have to use them. So that means our final answer is x is an element of square bracket negative 7 to 0, close square bracket in union with square bracket 2 to infinity, circle bracket. All right, let's move on and try some other ones. So now let's try solving this inequality algebraically. Okay, because that one, remember, means that we always, always, always have to use an interval chart, okay? So if you are solving a polynomial inequality of degree two or higher, and you have not used an interval chart, then your solution is not complete, okay? The only types of inequalities you can solve that don't require an interval chart are when they are linear inequalities. And we can see here with these terms on both sides, even when we collect them together, it's definitely gonna be higher than degree one. All right, so let's get started. Let's bring all terms to one side of the equation. Again, it doesn't matter. I am going to bring all these guys over to this side. All right, so when I do that, right, that becomes negative 2x squared minus 14x uh, plus 16 is less than or equal to zero. So again, this is very important for later we're gonna look for values that are zero or negative. All right, our next step is to collect like terms. So that gives us x cubed minus four x squared minus nine x plus 36 is less than or equal to zero. Uh, now we are going to factor, okay? Now for this one, you might've started by doing um, factor theorem, which is completely okay, but sometimes remember when you have four terms, four more terms, you might be able to do factoring by grouping, which is what I'm doing here. So in this group, 
All right. We have a GCF of x, and then in this group we have a GCF of negative 9. And when we take both those out, we get the same factor. So that means we can do factoring by grouping here, which will save us some time. So that means we get x minus 4 is one factor and x squared minus 9 is another factor. We can further factor this because x squared minus 9, okay, so this guy here is a DOS, difference of squares. So we can factor it as such. So we can factor that as x plus 3, x minus 3. So now we have three factors uh, less than or equal to 0. So again, I always just try to give this a new label. You can label it whatever you'd like. I just call it f of x. Okay. Remember when we do the interval chart, the only way we can do it is if we know what the zeros are. So now we notice that the zeros are uh, 4, negative 3, and 3. Okay. So that means uh, you just got to kind of visualize it if this helps. You're going to draw out a number line and write, out, write them out in their proper order. So negative 3, 3, and then 4. Okay. And you can see that that creates 1, 2, 3, 4 intervals. Okay. So however many zeros you have, always add the number 1, and that's how many intervals you should have. So now we're going to go to our interval chart and set it up like this. So our interval should be uh, when x is less than negative 3, when x is between negative 3 and 3, when x is between 3 and 4, and when x is greater than 4. So those four intervals are coming from visualizing it down here. Uh, your first row can be the turning point, so that can be, uh, sorry, your test point. Okay, so those are numbers that fit within these intervals. So in our case, I chose negative 4, 0, a number between 3 and 4 was 3.5, a number greater than 4 was 5. Remember, the other row components are always the factors of f of x. Okay, so keep that in mind. These are always the factors. And then your final line should be what they all are together. So they all multiply to equal f of x. All right, so let's go through. We're going to sub negative 4 into every x here and see what we get. So if we sub in negative 4 here, negative 4 minus 4, that will create a negative. If I sub 0 into this factor, I'm going to get a negative. If I sub 3.5 into this factor, a negative. If I sub 5 into this factor, I will get a positive. So you're going to go through the whole chart. You can go row by row, column by column. Okay. So you guys should be trying to finish that on your own. You can pause the video at any time that you need to kind of catch up or fill in a chart. And your final result should look like this. So remember, you always care about what the final line's answers will be. So you should get negative, positive, negative, positive. Now keep in mind, I know you're seeing a lot where they alternate back and forth. Um, don't always assume that it's going to do that. There are cases where you can have two negatives beside each other or two positive beside each other. Okay, so it's always important to show all your work and don't just assume. So remember, we're looking for when f of x is less than or equal to zero. So that means I'm looking for negative answers. Okay, so it always depends on the question. So that means my two solutions are going to be this guy and this guy. And remember, it has equal to, so that means I can put the equal to symbol in my final answer. So our final solution is um, x is an element of negative infinity to negative 3 square bracket in union with square bracket 3 to 4 square bracket. Now keep in mind, if you guys had rearranged this, um, if you brought all these terms to this side, 
um, and went through your statement, um, you would still get the same answer, okay? It was just that the numbers um, would be a little different over here. Okay, so no matter what way you bring it left or right, just keep going with your, with your solution and you should end up at the same area. All right, and our last question here, uh, it says the elevation of the hiking trail is modeled by this function, h of x, where h is the height above sea level in meters and x is the horizontal position from the ranger station, measured in kilometers. At what distances from the ranger station is the trail above sea level? So at what distances is the trail above sea level? So just keep in mind here, because X is the horizontal position from the ranger station, um, let's just say that when we get a negative X value, like if we think of a compass over here, when we get a negative X value, that's going to refer to distances to the west of the station. And when we get positive X values, that will um, re uh, refer to distances um, to in the east direction. Okay, so we're going to start again. They're asking for when the trail is above sea level. So that is when H of X is greater than zero. So I'm writing that right in. That's my first part is I'm creating my inequality. Right? They didn't give it to us. Um, they didn't give it to us this time, so we had to create that ourselves. Okay, so I set that greater than zero. Then I know that my next step is, if we do this algebraically, is to factor. Okay, so that means I'm going to have to do some factor theorem here. So remember, this is h of x. All right, so let's do factor theorem. I test h at one and I know it's equal to zero. So that means x minus one is a factor. So now we're going to do our synthetic division. So you're gonna create your L chart, put one on the outside and put our coefficients two, three, negative 17 and 12 at the top, and then go ahead and start doing your synthetic division. And your final result should be a quotient of 2x squared plus 5x minus 12. Now we have to further factor that. That is a complex trinomial. So we need to find two numbers that multiply to negative 24 and add to 5. So that would be 8 and negative 3. So we have to use uh, decomposition and we do our factoring by grouping and it leaves us with 2x minus 3 as one factor and x plus 4 as the other. So keep in mind, remember, we can't forget about this factor up here. So that means our expression is x minus 1, 2x minus 3, and x plus 4 is greater than zero. So all I did was rewrite this green line up here as this red one in factored form. From here, I can see that my zeros are one, uh, three over two, or 1.5, and negative four. So now you're gonna set up your interval chart. Again, if you have three zeros, that means you have four intervals. The first interval is x less than negative four, then between negative four and one, then one to 1.5, and then x greater than 1.5. You can add in your test points, so any number that satisfies those intervals. At the sides here, you're gonna put all the factors, so x minus one, two x minus three, and x plus four. And as your final line at the bottom, uh, h of x. All right, you can go ahead and start filling in the chart with your plus or minuses. And 
and you should get this as your final answer. So you should get negative, positive, negative, positive. Now keep in mind, we want to know when the trail is above sea level, so when it's greater than zero. So that means I'm looking for positive answers. So that would be here and here. So that means h of x is greater than 0 uh, when x is between negative 4 and 1 or when x is greater than 1.5. So that would be the proper answer here if this was just a knowledge question. But keep in mind this is a word problem, so we have to analyze what these numbers mean in terms of um, the ranger station, in terms of west and east. So how do we describe negatives? That means um, that many kilometers to the west direction. Positive numbers, it's that many kilometers to the uh, east direction. So we can say the trail is above sea level four kilometers west of the station to one kilometer east of the station, because it went from negative to positive, and for distances more than 1.5 kilometers east of the station. So just carefully go over that again and see how the negative and positives related to east and west. And that would be a proper, uh, therefore, statement for this word problem. Um, if you chose to do this graphically, I'll just briefly go over it at the side here. If you did this graphically, then again, you would still have to do all this work up until this point. So you would still have to go to this red uh, line up here. But then you would analyze, you would see your end behaviors. Okay, based on the fact that leading coefficient was positive and degree was odd. Okay, so it should be um, uh, going from as x approaches negative infinity, y goes to negative infinity, and as x approaches infinity, y also goes to infinity. You would still have to deal with your zeros. Uh, same zeros, they all have order 1, so therefore they all have a linear shape at the x-axis. Okay. Then you would draw a sketch of your graph. And again, I would realize that I'm looking for when um, h of x is greater than or equal to 0. So that would be when it's above the x-axis. And if you've drawn your graph correctly, um, it should be these two sections. And as you can see, if you do it this way, you will get the exact same answer as here. So between negative uh, 4 and 1 and 1.5 to infinity, and then you would analyze those in terms of west and east. All right, and that is it for the lesson here. So please keep in mind um, that if you have to do it algebraically, you must use an interval chart at some point. And then if I do not specify how you solve a polynomial inequality, then you can use the graphical method here, or you can use the algebraic method here. All right, I hope everyone enjoyed the lesson and good luck with the homework and let me know if you have any questions. Bye guys.